Hi, welcome to this week's edition of Blues Talk, where Dave, John and myself are going to look back at all the Heineken Cup fixtures from last weekend and look forward to our game uh, this weekend at home in the RDS against Cast. Well boys, great win, the two of you are over there in uh, Swansea, how was it? Uh, Swansea was, as Swansea is, it's a town that was bombed by the Germans and you can tell why. <laughs> um, yeah, performance, I mean, Harsh. <laughs> they were very... Um, a complete sea change in all the areas that causes problems against Munster and um, the team addressed against Ospreys against a team that can be quite similar to Munster in terms of its uh, development of the breakdown and stuff like that we got it all right um, you know for the first couple of minutes it, it, we, we had a lot of possession we had eight possessions in the first 10 minutes and we didn't actually break the game line once on any of them but then the whole thing started to build momentum started to build Ospreys were getting disheartened by you know, our defence and our set piece began to get on top and it, the game just turned around and for the for the second half, I mean, we were completely on top. Yeah, we well, we, we, our defence, I suppose, is what got us on top. Um, it, it must have frustrated the hell out of them because they just seemed to be driven back every time there was a rook. It was further back than the previous one when they were in possession and they just, they just seemed to, uh, didn't seem to be able to cope with our defence and uh, we did some we did some pretty exciting stuff uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the rough stuff in attack as well. We were guys brushing mm. each other out of the way, and um, you know a few huge handoffs and things like that. But uh, it was the defence that, that won it really, and we looked in control by the end of the game. We just looked like we could have if the game had gone on another hour, they still wouldn't have scored a try. You know? mm. Although we probably would have died of exhaustion. <laughs> but it, like it was such a massive. It could have been a potentially massive banana skin for us when. You kind of yeah. way, when you take everything into consideration, we're away in Swansea against the Ospreys, who traditionally we obviously haven't beaten. We're missing quite a, a considerable number of our leaders on the pitch. Ross yep. gets injured after t- less than twenty minutes. Things weren't stacking up well for us. All of those things make it all the more impressive. Like yeah. it, you know, it, they just uh, the, the leaders, Ross going missing, and a guy who's twenty two stepping in in the way that he did, and looks like we might have to rely on him this week. Uh, big time, but uh, to to get guys like Jamie Heaslip, Kane Healy, Sean O'Brien, they're the guys that stepped up and mm. really you know led the team. I mean, a lot was made last week of the influence that um, the Ospreys lines would have on the match, mm. and you mentioned three of them there. But the guys who really influenced the match were actually Leinster's lines. Yeah. Um, Jamie Heaslip, as you said, Sean O'Brien. Uh, Rob Carney, I thought, had an excellent Great game. Those, game yeah. those were the senior pros, and they all stepped mm. up. They, they really did. You could see the leadership <laughs> that they were uh, exerting on the pitch. You could see the influence that they were having on, on the younger players or the more experienced players uh, on the pitch. And it, was, it made a huge difference. I mean, each one of those would have been in contention for man of the match. Now, obviously, Sean won it, but, and we'll come to that. But um, they all had immense games. Isn't, yeah. it, isn't it great that we have that? Like yeah, the, yeah. The next yeah. level of Leinster players with, with mm. it. Bob Jennings and uh, Leo Cullen, who would be t- supreme leaders. You have these guys, okay, Jamie Heaslip's been there a good while as, as captain as well, but you have these guys now stepping up and taking over, mm. and you know we don't have to we don't have to go down a, a chunk because those guys are missing, like we perhaps might have in the past. Uh, a I, a bit of a realization a... dawning on guys like Carney and Kane Healy, and you know who are, that they are the leaders, and you know another guy who deserves, I think. Uh, been put into that category in terms of his on on pitch performance and leadership. It was actually um, a guy who's had a great season. We've mentioned it before. Is Devon Toner? He was yeah. Um, he was a very influential figure. You could you could see him around the pitch. His carries, his tackling, obviously his line out ball. But he, yeah. he, just the way he he led kind of if you like he led the kind of the back five from the front. <laughs> like that phrase, yeah. Got yeah. A nice turn of phrase. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it just goes to show the importance of of that monster fixture each year that we have coming oh, into yeah. the mm. like. It just blows away all of the cobwebs. Like you know, there was fixed a lot for us, I think. and fixed. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, you know, we were quite critical, say, of O'Brien last weekend against Monster, but my God, he proved us wrong. Mm. Well, that, that, but like but as they say, you know, form is uh, temporary and class is permanent. Well, that's the that's, that's the advantage that fixture gives us. I mean, it is to all intents and purposes. It, well, it is. It's a Heineken Cup standard fixture. It's some on some when when both teams are strong, it's even above that level. Mm. Um, so it's an advantage that both Munster and Leinster have used in the past. 
is yeah. is that fixture the intensity of that fixture which means that they hit the Heineken Cup they hit the ground running yeah previously we've looked on it as a kind of a dress rehearsal and that it gets everybody a run in their right positions just but but this time I think we got a lot more out of it mm, by mm. losing but I think maybe it the showed fact us what we what we if we're going to come in cold against a team like the Ospreys we wouldn't have had a hope that monster thing pointed all the fingers where they needed to be pointed mm. and and by God, they came back. In but I think the fact that it was played in Limerick as well probably was more beneficial yeah. to us than if it was played in Dublin because you expect really to win your home games and obviously yeah. going down to you know Limerick. Point. I, th- I think in the past when the team has been strong, <clears throat> settled and in form, um, the game in Dublin has been of less use to us except for, as you say, um, giving people a chance to play in the correct position and whatever, has been of less use to us than it has been uh, to Munster. This year, I think it was of more use to us than it was to Munster. Yeah. But like it was a peculiar kind of game because we were under quite a lot of pressure for the first 20 minutes. And, you know, really, if, if Hibbard, only the fact that he's as slow as a glacier, <laughs> he should have scored in that corner. Mm. And when he, you know, when they got a... Wo- the drag coefficient on his hair. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Put the belly on him. <laughs> but he didn't make it. And he had guys outside him that he could have passed or, he, you know, he, he had no pace to get there. But I mean, that, that scrum that we ended up getting the penalty from, we, yeah. we cleared our lines. We that lost the tr- we turn. lost the line out. Yeah. Turned it over, and uh, maybe we'll have a look at at the the build up to it. Well, it starts obviously with the turnover. Um, that was just brilliant strip there for James. Unbelievable! <laughs> like, I have to see that in slow motion because it comes up later. It? How did he do it? <laughs> and we go through a couple of phases of cut them out because they are just a couple of phases. But I wanted to show Darcy's carry. You know, that's one thing he does, and, and he's another he guy at a big game. Well he, did, yeah. he, get, he gets over the gain line every time. He people people expect the swashbuckling Darcy of old. And I don't think he's that player, but what he is, is he, he makes immense ground over the game line every time he carries. Oh, There's Rob Kearney again. Did, yeah. Fighting for every f- yeah. foot, you know, not just a yard. But the, 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 oh, there's the, a lovely break from Crowley. I mean, the, and, and great support. I mean, there's a couple of things have to go right for that try to happen. First of all, Gopperth has to, has to spot that there's a gap to put the yeah. man into. Secondly, the man has to spot that the gap is there to run into. And thirdly, Sean O'Brien has to both A, be in support and B, if you notice from the view behind, he muscles his way past two Ospreys players yeah. to get that ball. He wanted that ball more mm-hmm. needed than they did. That's it. But interesting, Cronin's pass to him was absolutely on the money because he, he really gave it the only chance to be... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it was the only chance he had. I mean, I've just seen he, him do it again and I still don't know how he did it. If, if Cronin had thrown that ball harder, O'Brien wouldn't have had time to get it to it because there was air on the ball. If you notice here, he has a chance to muscle his way between the two guys. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes tries are, you know, brilliantly crafted. And sometimes there's a little bit of luck. And there was a little bit of luck in that in terms of just the fact the player that it was was able to muscle his way <coughs> past. On another day, it could have been a little bit of obstruction as well, you know. Well, that's true. Look at where Sean comes in now. Okay, the guy didn't see him yet. Okay, fair enough. Sorry. Thought I might have been trying to obstruct but, him. But, but Cronin's he pass, he gave him the opportunity to get yeah. there and make it. Well, that's what the, when you when you're a kid and you're taught about passing, put the ball up in front of the eyes of the guy running onto it, yeah. and that's what he did. But like that was really that was uh, a seminal moment in that game because you know as I said earlier, we were under a bit of pressure at the start, yeah. but once we got that try, there was only one team in it. Well, what happened was, I mean, they had a, they had an awful lot of ball, but they weren't actually making the <clears throat> making huge gains. Mm. Um, and then the one time we we actually got a clear line break uh, when Jamie stripped the ball. Phase, yeah. phase, 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 try. I mean, it, to a certain extent, it must have been quite dis- disheartening for mm. the Ospreys yeah. because they'd been plugging away and plugging away and not really getting anywhere. I'm not saying they weren't getting anywhere because they were, but they weren't really getting to what they wanted to be, which was over the line. Whereas we got one clear opportunity and we took it. And that's that's what this team has. I mean, that's what the, why this team won three Heineken Cups in the last five years because they realised that at this level, if you it, you might only get one chance a game, so you better make sure you take it. it. But they're ruthless. They're ruthless oh, yeah. when they're in that form and they... They have a nose for the knot of the line, and they just really go for it and take Tur- it. Turnover ball is always the most dangerous. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. if you're, you're, you're uh, either <coughs> team or in their attack pattern, and you you get the ball off them, you've got several seconds to make hay. And if you can make hay in that several seconds, you know the All Blacks are the world champions at it, yeah. as well as being the actual world champions. <laughs> they're uh, th- that's where they're so dangerous. Go they completely ruthless. Have no ball for half the game. Get it for. Five seconds and boom, two tries. Yeah, you know how many times have they done that? Done that to us. I mean, we spoke briefly about O'Brien, but some of his displays was like the handoff he did on yeah. on bigger was crippling, but it oh. just like a rag doll. He just mm. smashed him out of the way, 
and unfortunately Gopper couldn't uh, pick up the pass but, but that's kind of the thing we, we expect that from Sean we expect those mm-hmm. big bruising massively muscular uh, line breaks but what we saw from Sean was a much more nuanced performance um, yeah. he was in support for the try which one would expect from a, a demon from, from on an open side as well, flanker yeah. and he was a demon on the ground and he was up against you know one of the very best open side flankers in Europe in Justin Tupurich yeah. I mean there's a serious argument that he's actually a better player than and Sam Warburton I'm not going to get into that now but that's the level yeah. he's at mm. um, and Sean for all of his turnovers and, <clears> and a number of other incidents beat him to the breakdown and got, got himself over the ball and either won the turnover or slowed it down which is the important thing obviously for an open side flanker so what we saw was not only the the, the kind of the classic six and a half performance that maybe we, we expect to see from Sean what we saw was an actual an out and out Groundhog 7 performance mm-hmm. Which he's been developing into, in fairness, mm-hmm. over the last few years, he's been getting better and better at it. Uh, I think he was originally possibly put at seven because he had to be on the field, and the other, you know, six and eight were, you know, possibly a little bit short for six. You know, need we need a few extra inches in the line out, but he's really made it his own now. He's mm-hmm. come in, you know, you couldn't accuse him of being, you know, a six and a half in terms of not doing the work no. at the breakdown and all that. Yeah. And you could say perhaps Jamie Heaslip did it for a while while you know, while Sean O'Brien was, was for both Leicester and Ireland, you know, coming into his own, but he's there now he, and he can do that stuff. Well one guy that got a maybe a bit of um you know, it was a bit of a contentious selection was Gotbert getting selected uh, um in front of Madigan. Mm. But I mean he certainly he's pay, repaid the fate that uh, O'Connor had in him with fourteen points, but not just the points that he got, the way that he played and the way he ran the back line and even to show the you know his commitment to the team, the tackle he did, and try saving tackle yep. actually on. But well, that uh, was on, on on Hessler. Yeah, that was right yeah. in front of where we were sitting. Right in um, front of it. Yeah. And Hessler had gone through, and I, I I thought that was a try. I yeah. I thought he was in. I and, was shocked when he. Had. And Gopper came across, and not not only tackled him, not only he absolutely creamed, creamed him. him yeah, he yeah. absolutely creamed him, and it reminded me of something that you said a couple of weeks ago about Kiwis. You know, they all have good basics. Good basics yeah. Sometimes he didn't; he hasn't executed them, but they're there. Yeah. Um, and he gave something that Leinster haven't had this season. I mean, he's played well on occasion, but he, he gave us the, a kind of the level of control that maybe Johnny would have exerted. Mm. You know, just picking the right place to play, the right time oh. to play, getting totally, us into yeah. the areas where we can play. Yeah, well, he, and that's that's what he did, and he controlled that game like like a maestro. He had it on a string. Yeah, yeah. He, he justified his selection. I think I don't know were we all unanimous last week in wanting Madigan to start, but yeah, I, I know I certainly mm. wanted him to start. Possibly a bit of emotion in that on my part as well as you know just to see a foreign guy coming in and you know, but by God did he justify his selection? And I, I'd have to say for next week. I'd, I'd have him on there for at least 60 as well you know? yeah well we'll come we'll come to next week's you know, match. that's the thing I mean I'm, 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 for, I personally would have preferred Madigan to start yeah. I would have gone said the same as you but you know the guy in form deserves the jersey and yeah. it's Madigan's job now to play better than to that get it back and yeah. maybe he will yeah well it's all to play for so I guess in the group but there's obviously there was plenty of other matches this weekend I think we'll start off with our, our old foes Munster's demise up in the Elephant's Graveyard Mm. Well, I watched it on Al Jazeera Nine <laughs> <laughs> uh, in a pub in uh, Swansea. Um, going into that match, if you'd said it, any other result other than Munster getting a five pointer was on the cards, I would have considered <clears> you <throat> to be quite quite mad. Yeah, agreed. I, I thought uh, they were just it was a formality, mm. and I think probably that's what did for them. They thought it was a formality too. Um, they played with a lot of intensity against us last week. It was the closest thing I've seen them do to the uh, Harlequins quarter final. Um, but but did they week, create anything against us, really? No, like but they, they were very just committed. Made us, and they, they did committed. what we did against the Ospreys. And, they were, but they made us make mistakes. For instance, they kicked the ball yeah. up in the air. They capitalised on our mistakes for not defending that very well. But mm-hmm. I don't think they... I couldn't really can't think of too many um, chances that they created in the game. Well, perhaps you could say that that's a, a reason why they mightn't have got five points. But to say that they were going to lose, mm. you can't believe that. But w- what I was going to say was, I think that the the height of their their intensity against us because they really wanted that. Yeah. They didn't want to lose five in a row. Don't blame them. But that kind of I wouldn't say drained them, but it's very hard to get yourself up. To that fever pitch again, even though it's the Heineken Cup. Anyway, well, I, I'm going to go back to Edinburgh. I'm going to go back to one of my favourite phrases. To win. Um, Munster Leinster games exist in their own bubble. 
Um, yeah. Form is meaningless. So it, you couldn't really judge how Munster would do against mm. Edinburgh or how Leinster would do against Ospreys based on that match because it, exi- it, it, it has its own little world, its own mm. little animus. But there that is that psychological in. thing of, of, of getting oh. up to a fever pitch and then having to do it again. Absol- the next absolutely. Week. But in it terms of. It's a team that you're expected to. But you can only go back to the well past. so often. And I. Yeah, in I terms of a game to form, I don't, think it, I don't think it has any value. Mm. Um, it can highlight things like it did for us. It can highlight things like maybe it should have done for Munster. But as, as a gauge of form, I don't think it has any value. What should have been a gauge of form was Munster's beating of Edinburgh earlier this season yeah. when a very understrength Munster team yeah, had, yeah. took on an admittedly equally understrength Edinburgh team mm. and <clears throat> beat it quite easily without even having to get it out of second gear. Mm. Um, but couldn't put them away. They, yeah, couldn't Edinburgh put them were away. quite creative in that game, as I remember it as well. Mm-hmm. They were, you know... They, they couldn't defend, but they, they put together a few nice phases in attack and they actually scored, I think. At but least three if, if you're looking at a game and the most creative back in the field is your man Scott, mm-hmm. there's something going wrong. He like, was he was great. He was brilliant. He but I mean, come on, how many times have we seen him play? I've and, never heard of him before. I mean, he's, he's a Bosch merchant. He's mm. he'd, he'd be right at home playing, you can imagine playing for Gloucester or Bath or mm. whatever in, in an Aviva Premiership match on a muddy pitch. He doesn't seem like the kind of player that, that would cause Munster as many problems as he did cause them. Mm. But one guy who did have a great game was Laidlaw. I thought he yeah. was absolutely outstanding. Was I thought he was the... Although that kick could come back to haunt them when it comes down to yeah. the final set of matches in January when it could be Munster and Edinburgh going for the final spot mm-hmm. and Munster have that point from Edinburgh. Well, that's, yeah. that's right. I, I don't expect Edinburgh to be anywhere near the mix at the end of January yeah. and I do expect Munster to be quite close to it. Um, but it... <clears throat> there, there hard are, to know hard to know there are problems that Munster need to fix um, they want to fix them in a couple of days and, so, and some of them some of them can't be fixed without medical attention I mean they suffered a couple of injuries yeah. as well which mm-hmm. isn't going to help well, and Tommy Bowe scored a fabulous try for Ulster against yeah. Leicester on Friday night and like Ulster you know they really they were under a bit of pressure at the start of that match mm-hmm. um, Leicester took the lead it could have gone against them and you know they really dug back and, and got a fabulous try they had two more disallowed Mm-hmm. but I thought Jackson again had another good game he did um, both a lot of, also created a lot of their own problems to be fair in, in, in fairness I thought Tom Court was actually quite poor in the scrums and particularly mm. in the first half I think the new laws don't suit him no I don't think they were so tall. I, I was looking at the position he was taking his feet were really far forward mm. and his backside was really high in the air yeah. and it was like he was coiled for the old mm. hit, hit. Yeah. but obviously that's gone now so he was getting himself into all sorts. He was un- unable to exert any real pressure and he was finding it very hard to keep himself down and in position. Um, they sorted it out in the second half though. Yeah. Um, mm. he, you could see he was, he, he was beginning to get his feet back a bit. He's beginning to, to, to work oh, it out a bit. He got pinged a couple of times. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he, he, he began to work it out. Um, so also kind of brought a lot of pressure onto themselves. Um, but they were, they were quite good in a lot of areas. I mean, um, I thought Tommy Ball was excellent. Jordan Payne was very good. Um... What, Jordan Payne? Jared. Jared Payne. Um, I thought Paddy Jackson was excellent as well. Mm. Um, it was a good battle actually between himself yeah. and Toby Flood, who I also thought had a good game. Yeah, yeah, he's good solid uh, 10. Uh, maybe a little bit too sol- solid and not enough flair at, at international level. Mm. But, he, you know, at Heineken but Cup level. When, when Pinar came on, good. you could just see the control yeah. that he brings to the game. Well, that was it. I mean, we talk about the 23-man squad. It wasn't just Pienaar. It's been the advantage of being able to bring on Henderson as well, yeah, for example. Yeah. Yeah. A really, really class player. Uh, Stuart Olding, who's young, but you know has has a hundred Irish caps in front of him if he wants them, kind of thing. Mm. I mean, he's he's that good. Um, So Ulster actually, although they had a young bench, probably had the better bench, so they were able to keep Mm. it stronger for longer. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I mean, I really rate Henderson. He's just oh yeah, yeah. He's him and um, Richie Gray's little brother for uh, Glasgow. Yeah, he's a great player too. I mean, there's two young guys. I think Gray's even younger. I think he's like nineteen twenty. And Henderson's 21 22, but. Well, know. that was a match that surprised me, that result. I mean, they were walloped 51 28 by Toulon. Yeah. And, you know, it's a shame, really, because I thought that was going to be a lot closer than it was. Mm, Toulon looked scary. Mm. When they, in the first half, they just looked frightening. When they got the ball out to the back line, <coughs> the thing about Toulon always was that they were uh, a bought in team and they didn't have any spirit or heart to bloody have now. And the handling that they have, you know, the. the, the Wilkinson did a few very nice touches for I think one of their first tries um, and you could just see the back line the way the ball went out doop, 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 out really quickly through the hands and they, they made gain they broke the gain line every time at will nearly and Glasgow 
okay they were a bit they were cut they were cut napping I suppose you could say but they're normally a really good defensive team mm. but they, they just ran through them and uh, you know it's frightening for the competition of course the, the French champions cast beat uh, Saints um, yeah, 1913 in, in, yeah it was, it was a sort of a it could have gone either way really it was one of those games and it was an intercept try was the turning yeah. point in, in it um, but I'm not sure whether that was a good or a bad result for us yes it was Yes, it was a good or a bad result. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I think, uh, yeah, it's hard to know. I would have preferred Northampton not to get the bonus point. Uh, that would have been perfect. You know, three nil would have done, <laughs> would have done nicely, or a draw. If we could really imagine that. But uh, yeah, ca- cast next week are a bit, bit of a scary proposition. We don't really know don't what's going to turn up. We yeah. don't know. It could be. <clears throat> They could be the meanest pipe hitting mothers on the whole planet that turn up and are going <laughs> to. You have to stop watching Pulp Fiction. <laughs> <laughs> they could be really nasty and, and uh, you know, like they were when we played them away down there mm. last De- or December on 8th, I think it was. Um, if they're like that, we could be in for a long day. Yeah, and but that, I was down at that game in, in Cast and we actually scored two tries. Yeah. They got kicks. Yeah. I don't know how they won them. I really still don't get how they won that game they got that by being El Morte in the pack <laughs> like they just they were, we were going into the rooks with the ball and they were coming out with it they mm. were they just we, we'll, we'll see how serious Castor are um, not even when they name their team 10 minutes into the match because with French teams you, you, you always get one or two things either manic dedication or complete disinterest and after 10 minutes that's generally the telling point. Hit them hard, hit them early, and they'll lose interest. Remember Racing Metro Hopefully. came over here a couple yeah. of years ago, and yeah. they'd signed big stars. They'd signed useless Bergamasco, and they'd Chabal. signed Chabal, the second biggest spoofer in French yeah. rugby. And Issa folded them up. And they didn't like it up them. I mean, it's a, it's mm. an old fight, but they didn't. And they just went into their shell, and they never came out of it again for the rest of the competition. Yeah. If you can hit Castor early enough and hard enough, they start thinking, I don't want to get injured for the rest of the top 14 campaign. Mm. You know, that sometimes happens with them. Mm. Now, at home, it's a different proposition because they don't want to get hit on the way off the, uh, off the pitch. But, you know, if you can get them away from home and hit them hard and hit them early, well, if you look they'll at kind of be a bit windy. We'll see because, I mean, they, we'll, speak, we'll speak more in depth, I suppose, just shortly. But they, they are going to be in a situation where they are defending, you know, top 14 champions. That's this it, is yeah. a chance now to turn a very good team into a great team. And kick on. As they, say. Yeah. they don't have they don't I don't think they're there yet in terms of kicking on in terms of being a two not. front team I mean it, 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 even great sides like Claremont it took them a while to get into that position and they have a very, they've actually a pretty narrow squad they're a very small squad um, I believe yeah, they only use about 30 players yeah. uh, now they have some super players <coughs> um, um, particularly oh, yeah. Cockett mm. he's one of the he's one of the best players in Europe in my opinion Rory yeah but you know one player does not a team make um, I did, it's one of the reasons why I'd advocate the selection of Boss actually to combat mm. him um, but you know it, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see with French teams you just never know you never know what to remember Claremont came over to Stoneman Park and put out the, the Espoirs basically yeah, um, and they were kind of you know muck mm-hmm. in the second half they, they went well for 10 minutes a few hits went in and that was the end of that and Racing Metro last year Racing Metro last year as I, as I yeah. already said so it remains to be seen it's very hard to know with French teams you just can't predict how they'll go well, because in, in the competition last year I know it was around one or two but uh, Ulster got a bonus point off them in Ravenhill and the, the bonus point try I think was Pienaar passed to somebody whoever he passed to anyway the the player on the cast side just kind of looked at him yeah Gave he, up. he just looked at him and, uh, do you know what? Was it, was it the game's nearly over was it Tomosi Nagusa don't think no, so. no, he was with Montpellier. No, no uh, I can't remember who the no. player was, but like that shows the mentality. If that kind of a team turns up, happy days. But mm. did you notice when Ulster went back? I think oh, it yeah. was six five or something or nine six or whatever they won. But that's 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 what I said. The difference between a French team at home and a French team away is mm. is, is is. Well, let's hope they're a French, a typical French away team. Yeah. Is all we can hope for because with well, the tight head issues and a few other things, we could be uh, we could be under pressure. You know, if they send out a fairly serious somebody told me their their star loose head is isn't playing or I, I i actually don't think we have any tight head issues to be perfectly honest with you um mike ross is injured but i think martin moore is more than capable of yeah, taking it's just on. a bench though uh, it's the bench be yeah, yeah. of course martin moore is capable the, the point is that who's going to be on the bench are you going to sell a tape one of the injured guys together or are yeah. you going to risk 
having Jack McGrath's cover for no, the tight head side. I mean, to be perfectly honest, if it wasn't three for three injured tight heads, if it, if it if it wasn't for you know concerns external to Leinster, there wouldn't be a problem with it. Nobody would ever would it wouldn't be mentioned twice that yeah, Ross would be on the bench. Russian, yeah, yeah. You know so. Mm. Well, one team that did put up a fabulous away performance was Scarlets against Quinns. Yeah, I mean they Didn't were sensa- either, well they were they? sensational. Oh, uh, highlights! Brilliant. I saw the I saw the first half in a pub in the same pub in Swansea. Mm-hmm. Second half got to the stadium. Watched the second half in the concourse of the stadium. They were absolutely superb. They really were. It was a great game actually. Both teams were very very good. Mike Brown for Quinns was absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, scored two lovely tries. Won them with a lovely mm-hmm. little kind of half dummy stop and he and he kind of went round the outside it was really really good there was some poor defending though as well oh there was some poor there was some fairly shame, shameful mm. defending from both sides yeah, it'd have it, to be really to get that scoreline out of yeah. those two but teams but first time in a long time I've seen Scarlets actually play like a traditional Scarlets team but they looked like the, the Scarlets team that was in our group about three seasons ago yeah. in the Heineken yeah. Cup I think the year we got to the semi-final mm. and they were just had all that young crowd that were coming through um, North and yeah. Um, all, all those young oh, guys who'd le- who have subsequently yeah, left, with the yeah. exception of John Davies, John Davies who was who was excellent was. again. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's I mean, Scarlet's teams have always been famed for the brio with which they play. Mm. They the around, they get yeah. the ball let out wide. They have great skills, good steppers, and they look like that again. They that young fella on the all the score tries were scored by Williams. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're practically all backline. The, yeah. it's William I is it? Yeah, William I. Yeah, the guy the, the guy who scored the the, the their last try look. It, could could have been broken from the same mould as Shane as Shane Williams. Yeah. Um. Little small little stepper of a guy. Yeah, yeah, just a burst guy, of yeah. acceleration. Really, really good, good try. But they look <clears> like <throat> a Scarlet's team. That's the way Clinetti have always played. Leon, is it? Hmm? Leon or Leroy or? Uh, oh, the, the the Williams. Fred Williams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, it was good to see, and it was good to see that. I mean, Quinns aren't as good as they were last year. They're certainly not playing as well as mm. they were. Um, Jordan, but they have Jordan Williams. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, but they have some serious talent in that team. So it was a great result for um, a great result for Scarlets, and uh, it's glad to see a bit of luck of Simon Easterby's way finally because he yeah, was a player yeah. I really admired. Yeah, you know. Mm. And just the last of the match we're going to talk about is Connacht um, going down gnarly to Saris. I flicked onto that match and there were I think there were fourteen three down, and yeah. then kind of I looked at it half seventeen all. Oh, might get a bit of this. And apparently, and they didn't score in the second half. Yeah, but apparently that. Uh, Dan Parks just missed a kick to go ahead just before half time. I didn't see it myself, but they were attacking the line. I did see the very end of it. Yeah, they were attacking it was, the line yeah, right yeah. to right to the end, and I'd say would have been so good if mm-hmm. they just could have got over that line because they were six points behind. Well, Sar- Saracens aren't very good at much, but one thing they are good at is defending. Defending, yeah, yeah. They're big lumps, and uh, you know, they, I think they got a shock. They were lucky to get out of dodge with the win, and they know it. One more result I think that is notable, it kind of caught my eye, was um, in the Amman. Mm. Uh, Newcastle haven't really struggled and needing a pretty much last minute kick to get over uh, Bucharest Wolves. <laughs> wow. um, it finished up 13 12 to Newcastle. Mm. I wonder what team did they put out though? Which, the Wolves? Oh, Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> there were lots of chotos in the. <laughs> well, it's hard to know, but you know, still for a, for a Romanian team. I mean, people are talking about what's the contribution of Italian teams and what's the contribution for a Romanian team to get that close. They're kind of a put together team, though, aren't they? The Bucharesti Wolves. There's a lot of internationals in it. I mean, there's an awful. They're, they're coached by Lynn Howells, mm. who's the the Romanian coach. coach. He's the national yeah. coach. So it's 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 a bit of a national academy side. Yeah. Um. But you know, it's it's it, it, it's it's good for rugby in Romania. It's good for rugby on the continent that at least mm. you know at least one of their teams is competitive against you know the meritocrats of English rugby. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, who qualified by being in a different division at all, entirely last year? Go on. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, this leads us on to our match anyway on Saturday. So, all questions I've got for you is: Is it going to be Jimmy or Mads? I think it has to be Jimmy. I think form guy has to play as far as I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah, I, got, I, form I'd guy love, deserves the jersey. I'd mm. love to see Mads come on if we're either five points behind or ten points ahead or whatever. Uh, you know, maybe fifty. 60 minutes I'd love to see him get a chance to come on and really tear it up because I believe he would I'd actually no I'd actually love to see him come on and close out the game Mm. rather than tear it up because we know Madigan can tear Tear it up up, we've seen him tear it up time after Mm. time after time and the reason why why Gopperth has the start is that O'Connor at least the the perception at least is that 
Gopper is the guy who can control a game, play the Johnny Sexton style role, if you like, or the Raj mm. style role. So I'd like to see Madigan come on and get the opportunity mm. to play that game and show that he has added that string to well, his bow. He did, if you remember last year against Munster down in Tom Park, yeah, yeah. Sexton yeah, yeah. was taken off. He got a bit of a knock. He didn't want to come off. Mm-hmm. But um, Madigan came on and Madigan came on and, and everything, didn't yeah. he? But I'd, I'd like that's because it's it's like we often said, like and and, and Jim when he's here refers to the difference between Boss and Redden, mm. and then when Boss came in, he played one way and Redden played another. Well, how Boss kind of, if you like, rose to to be on a par, maybe even above Redden in terms of selection, mm. is that he added what mm. Redden had that quickness of both thought and pass yeah. to his game. I have him above Redden at the moment. Yeah, so the same here. Current form. <clears throat> and I think that that's what Madigan has. Madigan has, to, we know he can do it. What he has to do is he has to prove to the coach that he can do it. Mm. And he has to do, and the only way he can do that is by actually doing it. Well, for three years under Schmidt, there was an a home and away Heineken mm. Cup team. Yeah. And we have no history of, of O'Connor. So we don't know what way he's going to react. Is he going mm. to play you know, pick, pick the same team on mass again for this fixture. Is he going to mix it up? Is he going to play Redden so instead of Boss? I'll tell you one thing that I'd be scared he might do um, is, and I don't think he will now, but this is just a real left field one here. Uh, the way he threw Lottie Takiri in at 13 against Munster, I'd be afraid he'll throw Kirshner in there. I play Luke Fitzgerald there as it Well, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd actually play Mackin again. Would you? Yeah, I'd go as you were. Maybe I'd bring Luke Fitzgerald uh, in at the at the start, but then you've got the question of who do you who do you drop? Mm. I t- I'm not entirely sure what happened when uh, Fitz came on for Mac and did, did Fergus slot into third? Fergus slot in, yeah, into so, centre. Yeah. Pers- uh, I would uh, I would leave Mac in there because a I think he's been playing reasonably well. Um, B I, I, the the parts I fear about cast are not necessarily. Out in the back line, no. where they're going to be running at Mackin, and see, I think bringing in Takiri over him for the Munster game was a little bit of a slap in the face to him when he'd been playing reasonably well. Mm. Um, and if you brought in Kirshner now ahead of him, because uh, it's been in the paper. The reason I say it is it's been in the paper, and the word they used was I think it was the Times. The words they used was uh, or were that he can play outside centre. They named it. Uh, wings as well as full back they didn't say he can play anywhere else in the back line mm. they specifically said he can play outside centre but per- personally I wouldn't go that way um, I don't know. if I were to make a low. change to outside centre it would be one of either McFadden or Fitzgerald, or Fitzgerald. personally i go for Fitzgerald if, if it was me picking the team because I think he plays in a very similar <clears> style <throat> but you could see the, the rationale behind say uh, either A sticking with Macken or B putting McFadden in there because mm-hmm. um, as you say they're That'd a team be my two they're, they are a team that plays from out to in if, if you like and uh, so having McFadden there the question is I mean we've gone from a situation actually uh, against Munster where we were looking you know kind of sparse in the, in, in, in the back three mm-hmm. to a situation now where we've got a bit of a surplus of talent now um, you've got yeah. both Carnies you've got Luke you've got McFadden you've got um, Kershner all in the mix yeah. which is only a good thing yeah, and if Takiri gets fit again, you'll have him. Uh, the, Darren Hudson played for the A's last week, mm-hmm. and he's a real promising looking guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he's not going to get a, a. I think he's. No, he's not in the Heineken. No, he's not, no. So he's not going to get a look in at the Heineken, but, you know, hopefully at Rabo level we get to see a bit more of him because he looks like he's well worth developing, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but back to, the, back to the match itself. There's not too many questions around selection, and I think we've nearly covered all of them. The, who's going to get the bench tight head spot? Uh, bent, halfbacks maybe yes. Bent is not uh, the, the, somebody said there was a rumour he was going to play in the B&I and if it wasn't last week it was going to be this week so I, I feel he might be just about fit again mm. but is you wouldn't throw him straight yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. every prop in our senior squad yeah, is registered pay, I guess, uh, yeah. but uh, yeah, I wouldn't throw him straight into the Heineken Cup even on the bench necessarily uh, but then what are your other options if Rossi isn't fit you're not going to get a you, you know nobody's going to want him risked mm. uh, if he's not entirely fit if, 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 Ross, if Ross weren't available and Bent were fit then I would take the risk and throw him straight into the Heineken Cup on the bench because a bad tight head playing a tight head is a hundred times better than the world's greatest Good loose head playing head. a tight head mm. I mean it's as simple as that um, well, I'd, I'd pick somebody out of the AIL before I'd pick yeah, McGrath, McGrath or Connell to play a tight well, we saw McGrath what happened to Court we yeah. saw what happened to Court yeah. in Twickenham and Court's a line <laughs> you know steady 
Well, no, but he is. I mean, <laughs> I the, 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 guy's, right. the guy's a line. I mean, and he got absolutely <laughs> mad. The guy's an Irish international. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's played in the Heineken final. And he's a fine, loose head prop. But, yeah. He ain't no tight head. But if, you've, if, you're, if you say you throw a guy in from the AIL... A good guy. <laughs> hasn't hasn't McGrath played AIL at tight head up up until quite recently? Yeah, but I don't think he's I think I don't think he's ever been anything more than functional even at that level <clears throat> in that position. People seem to consider the two positions interchangeable. They're not. Mm-hmm. They're no more interchangeable Who are than these people than out half and scrum half. That's. His, I think they're too, I think they're even more different than those. I, two well, I, I would suggest I would though, so, yeah. but I, I think out half and scrum. I'm not yeah. part of the French kind of thing that they're. Mm. One can cover for the other. They're, I think they're radically different they can positions. If they're, if they're Freddie Mitchell like yeah, or but whoever, you know. I think that they're radically different. And I think even a poor Ruben tight Keener. head does better than a good loose head when playing in tight head position. Um, mm. I just don't think it's a I, I, I would patch up. My choices would be patch up Ross, go for Bent, get somebody. But we can't get somebody now because they have to be registered by. I don't know. It's 12 o'clock tomorrow, isn't it? Uh, I think. 12 o'clock tomorrow for emergency. Some emergency yeah, emergency yeah, tight heads, yeah. Prop. You can bring in emergency Regulation. front row players uh, so, without having to make changes to your squad on a match on a per match basis. Fiki but, was in the paper saying that they're not going to. Anyway. But yeah, they have to come within. Maybe he'll tug out. They have to be already within your system. So, so. I'd let him. Although he was a loose head as well, wasn't he? He was. Yeah, he was a loose mm. head. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's all really up in the air. I mean, we, the rest the rest of the team, I don't think changes. Uh, no, I don't think the back five was, changes at that's all. That's what I was working towards. I mean, yeah. there's nobody else. I don't think anyone picked up any knocks. Hopefully not. Hopefully no. We didn't hear anything anyway. No. They would have, somebody would have notified somebody about it. Because for all we know, Brian Driscoll could play on Saturday and everything becomes yeah, I think there was a lot of rumours that he's not going to be ready. Yeah, unlikely. I know, but I'm just saying, I mean... And if they're not going to risk Ross, yeah. they're definitely not going to risk him. He'll get a run against Connacht and, mm, yeah. and whoever just before he goes into the AIs to, yeah. to firm him up, I'd say. Of course, there's another, another feast of rugby also on this weekend. Um there's the match down in, in Limerick which we've briefly spoke about against Gloucester mm. I mean would you say that if Munster lose that game they're that gone. Penny well they're gone but that Penny is been going to be show, he's in the departure lounge oh I'd say Anthony Foley sharp in his knives if if <clears throat> if Munster lose against Gloucester he's gone I can't see it any other way really? I mean You've got a situation where Munster are already selling tickets for a Heineken Cup match on the open market. Mm. I mean, that's never happened yeah. before. I mean, I don't, and I don't think it's Rob Penny's fault that they've. I don't think it's his fault. Has I mean, he failed to to try to, um, to to re or to introduce a new, the new system or the new style of play? He's you can't make soup out of shite. Uh, well, it's not even that if shite. It's just that. That's Cavan phrase. You can't, you can't, well, like if you're from Cavan, you might be able to make soup out of shite. No, you just try and pass it off. That's all even. But anyway, uh, the, the, yeah, Penny P- Penny got slaughtered. I was, we were actually, uh, the weekend we played Wasps, we were actually just happened to be by coincidence in the team hotel, uh, the Munster team hotel, before they played, the night before they played Quince. And Penny was getting slaughtered by, there was an MRSC do or something on it and he was getting ripped to bits I was you know I came in at the end of it so I didn't really see it but from what I heard he was eaten alive now mm. okay they came out they won the against Quinns the next morning and he could do no wrong uh, but I think the problem the problem is that he's trying to play referring back to the statement from earlier where you say that uh, Kiwis have good basics that means that you can put a second row out in the wing mm. and expect him to do all well, the stuff and, and it works the monster team are just not they're, they're not <coughs> trained in that way they're not they didn't come up that way they weren't in new zealand they, they don't have the you, you also have a thing as well that you know traditional monster rugby um has a certain way of playing exactly and what I was that way of playing is not going to win anything ever ever again the laws have changed i mean it's as simple mm. as that they never that kind of rugby will never be successful rugby you could argue again. beat uh, harlequins in the quarter yeah, it lost to claremont mm. um so it didn't win anything it didn't win in the league didn't win anything mm. right Rob Penny wants to play a more modern style of rugby yeah. right something that you know has it's a not chance to fit your style of but rugby to your players no it's not a matter of fitting your style of rugby to your players there are a cadre of both players and officials within Munster Rugby who do not want that style to succeed we know it we knew it under McGann and it's the exact same under Penny there are guys there who just do not want to play anything that deviates from the one true Catholic holy apostolic faith of ball so, of the Dave? jumper yeah I really do genuinely believe that a little that. bit of a stretch no I genuinely believe that mm. we saw well, we saw what happened to McGann there was constant undermining of McGann as things began to 
as the wheels Unravel. began to come off the wagon. And you wait. If Munster don't win against Gloucester now, I think I think even the worst Munster team in the world would beat Gloucester because I don't think Gloucester are all that mm. good to be honest with you. Not in the pack anyway. No. Um, but if if Munster say for example don't get out of their group, wait until you see it'll be dust down the headlines from McGann and change the name. Well, anyway, we we'll see about that one. The other one, another good one, I think is going to be is Montpellier against Ulster, and I think yeah. this is going be to cracker. be. We'll really see what what Ulster's mantle yeah. is and see if they're going to be contenders because they've been there and thereabouts either Heineken Cup or Pro 12 in the last couple of seasons. And I said it at the start of the, of the year, if if they don't win something this year... Oh, they have to. They have to get a trophy. Th- that yeah. team is just going to break up. Yeah. I mean, they can... You know, it just needs to win something for its own sake. Well, they're going to be without Muller. Uh, Muller will be gone if Muller will be, be gone. But like, yeah. they've been doing pretty well with it well, they, they, so far. I mean, they have Dan Tuohy, they've Lewis Stevenson. They yeah. play a good, good lot. Ian mm. Henderson. Ian Henderson is another one they that could, could start yeah. there. Um... Are Montpellier what they were two years ago? I don't know. I haven't been watching them. I, I don't have Satanta, so I, I don't get to see <laughs> much top 14. Or, or this year, I don't get to see any uh, premiership either. Um, to be honest, there's enough rugby on the telly with mm, you know, This is what your wife says, yeah. <laughs> That's what she does say. I don't know that Montpellier are the team they were two years ago. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I, what I was going to say about Ulster is they're, they, they've built a lot of strength in depth. If you look at the final they played against us in 2012 that team had great first 15 but didn't have much depth it's an awful lot more depth mm-hmm. now, an awful lot more uh, and it doesn't miss guys like Afoa as much or even Muller as much I mean they could go into a Heineken Cup with, without either of them now and I wouldn't be too worried about it there's one guy who two years ago who, I would have or a year, people haven't even ago. mentioned barely mentioned he was the absolute core of, month, of, of Ulster teams for 10 years and he's out and he hasn't been mentioned as Paddy Wallace. Yeah. Mm. Because they have two yeah. superb young players. Olding and Marshall. Olding and Marshall to, to mm. fill in there. And Cave. And, and, well, Cave at, at outside, yeah. But in, in terms of the inside centre position. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've, they've got real strength. They've jet, um, what's his name? Michael Allen has really come on this year. Yeah. Um, so they, this is this, the strength mm. and depth. They've, just they've got, got, they've got, got four top-class wingers now. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're very, very strong. The question is... How how will they go away from home? Can that's they always put been all Ulster's. together in yeah. Montpellier. Yeah. That's that, place. that's the next step in the revolution, um, yeah. because that's one area where they have traditionally been weak, or not traditionally, but over the last no, few they years never, they have a very very poor record in They're France. Very poor they record won in France. France. I don't you think they have cast la- uh, last year. Oh, cast last that was the first year. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the question is, how the, how will they do? It'll yeah. tell us wh- what they're if they're serious yeah. about it. Um, I I I think uh, I certainly think three of the Irish provinces will win. Um, I think Leinster, Munster, and Ulster will win. Um, just yeah, I well, I think it could be four for, because for Connacht plays Zebra away, and I think. Well, the question is how much. I think this is the game Zebra waiting for. I, so. I honestly think that mm. this is. They've been preparing for this game for the last three weeks since the Cardiff game. They put everyone in ice. Yeah. Um, and this is the game they're waiting for. Um, this is going to be actually. It's going to be people will unfairly, and I've seen it already. Uh, labeled the Battle of the Basement. <laughs> um, I think this is going to be one of the best games of the weekend I really do think so because I think mm. they're quite evenly matched I think Connacht are a slightly better team mm. but they're away well, from I home I think better. Yeah, uh, they're away from home I think Zebra are I think this is a game Zebra have been focusing on for their entire season is focused on this game win a Heineken Cup match yeah just like Ironi did yeah mm. Yeah, and right. an, another well the other match from our pool Saints against Ospreys will Ospreys come out swinging? Oh, I'd love to see them win that. that Where is the game? Great. It's in the gardens. Then Ospreys will come out falling over. <laughs> sure. Ospreys are crap in England. QED. Yeah. I don't know. I I hope you're wrong, Dave. Is all I can say. Oh, oh I really I hope, hope I'm wrong. I'd love to see them win down there. Um, I I I actually quite. <laughs> um, since they got rid of the whole kind of club showbiz thing I actually quite like the Ospreys um, yeah. they've got Very some team, yeah. they've got some really good players really really good players players that you like to admire like yeah. Alan Wynne Jones and Pirich and yeah. you know these are good did you, guys did you look at the stars that they used to have oh yeah like they oh, yeah. had Marshall in France, no. they are, but even the guys they bought they bought in mm-hmm. you know Jerry you're Collins talking Jerry Collins, Jerry Collins Marshall was... they had uh, Terra Blanche there. played for mm-hmm. them for a while they played had, for them for a long time yeah they had even Shane Williams you know they had real they, Henson of course like they had hook, they, but they had like sort of a he kind did. of a watered down version of Toulon now. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like they had sort of the Galacticos, and they just never gelled, never did anything for them. Now oh, they, they gelled bring, plenty. 
Because yeah, they had lots of hair gel. <laughs> but but they, they, they just, um, like that, the team now are homegrown, home produced. And because obviously they don't have the budgets to go out to the market and buy big name players, but yeah. they have a huge hinterland of rugby clubs around there. Just yeah. like Leinster do, you know. Buy one or two big name players, but get the majority of your squad from mm. your local area. And, and they're probably the most gelled I can use that phrase again. The mm-hmm. most gelled region in terms of um, because Clinetly are kind of a one team. Like they're just basically, I just call them Clinetly. Clinetli. Yeah, Clinetli the Scarlets are basically Clin- Clinetly's region is massive. It's yeah. virtually all of Wales. Uninhabited. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, there's no rugby in any of it except around you know Clinetli. the traditional Clinetly area. Uh, the and Dragons have never really got the Gwent, the rest of Gwent no. on board, no. and Cardiff and Ponty, that big row between Cardiff and mm. Ponty, and Valley's rugby being disenfranchised and all of that whole history. Whereas the Ospreys, Ospreys are, have a, have even a, got Bridge End on board, which well, is... they've established an identity outside of rugby. As mm. I mean, you've heard uh, that area referred to as Australia. Yeah. Um, members the one of true par- region. Yeah, members of Parliament have used mm. the, that term to describe that area. Mm. Mm. So it, they have an identity. They've created an identity for themselves that yeah. is, that has gone beyond rugby. The problem is it hasn't brought people into the stadium. No, that's that's the, the big problem. Right. Thing. I was talking to a guy and there's a lot of talk that Ospreys are looking to move out of that stadium. Really? Um, but the rent must kill them. Well, it's going to go... Uh, Swansea City are putting it up to 35,000. They have plans in place to put it up to 35,000. Wow. Um, that's going to be far too big for them. Mm. They'd nearly be better going back to the Nall or to St. Helens. Yeah. You know, putting some money into they look like developing kips. those. Both those clubs look like kips. <laughs> yeah, but if you, if you de- redevelop mm. them to six or 7,000 seater mm. stadia, it can be done. Yeah. You know, look, look what Glasgow did. Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever it's going to happen at the weekend, it's going to be good fun. And thanks a million for watching. And thanks a million to the lads. Cheers.